Suna Baba, protectors of the Suna. Suna Baba, protectors of the Suna. In alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Welcome to another session of the Muslim personality. And this is one of the most important uh, series that I'm teaching because this series is a series that will give you the information that you need to change your character to that which is pleasing to Allah. Being Muslim is not simply just saying that you are a Muslim. There are certain behaviors, there are certain personality traits, you know, that we all should have. And yesterday we spoke about a few personality traits and let me give you guys a brief quiz on them. For example, we spoke yesterday as to how uh, in order to be a true believing Muslim, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us that your personality should be one that rushes to do good. Why is it so, what, first of all, what does it mean to rush to do good? And secondly, why is this something that's so important? What does it mean to rush to do good? And why is this so important for us to possess as a, a personality trait? Who would like to tell us? Sister Sabrine, there's Sabrine. She's not here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Oh, yeah. I, I was just writing it down. Uh, the, the Muslim personality and to rush to do good. Yeah. For me, what does it mean? For me, it means rushing to, to, to get those good deeds in, to get those, to do the good thing, to do the good before I return to Allah, to do all the, all the things that I, I need to be doing. And when I say that, I don't mean washing the laundry. I mean doing. I'm talking about the spiritual, the the the. Uh, what I say to Allah when I what I say to Allah when I mean uh, allow my my uh, good deeds, exactly. my good deeds to be the last of my deeds. Y'all hear that? And you can see that this is something that Sabrina uh, does do. You know, she understands this concept. When you truly understand a concept, that means you practice it. You can tell that Sabrina is one that tries to do as much good as she can, because like me, she knows she's got one foot in the grave. That we, Allah has blessed us to live over the age of 30. Anyone who lives over the age of 30 is fortunate because the lifespan of our nation is only 60 at 70 years at the most. OK, so when you live to be the age of 30, you want to rush to do as many good deeds as you can do. So they will be in your favor. As she said, she rushes to do as many good deeds as she becomes closer and closer to death, because we never know when we're going to return back to a law. And, you know, she does the deeds that are most pleasing to him. Anyone else? Good job, Sabrina. She started you guys off. Any of you young girls got something to say? Uh, Fardalsa, you have something to say? Anybody else, you know, would like to share with us what it means to rush to do good deeds and why uh, we should do so? Yes. It, Okay, go ahead. You're here. Uh, I was at the car dealership yesterday getting my car done. And I was there for maybe two hours. And every now and then I'd say maybe subhanAllah, I'm going to do that. And then I got up, went to the bathroom, made my salats there, made the door there, came out, went to the uh, snack machine. And there was this Muslim sister sitting with a back turned. 
I gave her the greetings. She gave me the greetings back. And then I sat opposite her. And all of a sudden, my right hand began to do dick was like crazy. It's like I couldn't do it in the bathroom, but all of a sudden now I'm going to remember a lot. And it's probably because I saw that Muslim sister and I was fighting with myself saying to me, are you doing this to show off in front of her? Or are you doing this because you know you need to do it to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because most of the time I would do it to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But yesterday I had to question my own motives. So we had to be careful, you know, even though we remember the law, trying to earn our way to paradise, to get good deeds. We got to know what we're doing. We got to be conscious of what we are, of where we are and what we're doing and why we're doing it at all times. Exactly. Good point that Sister Anissa brought up here. The road to paradise is not easy. We can sit there and say, oh, I'm going to remember Allah. I'm going to say, subhanAllah, he wa bihamdihi, subhanAllah, he wa while I'm waiting on my car to get fixed. But then the thing is, will Allah accept it? Like she said, there's another woman sitting across from her who's a Muslim. So she questioned herself, am I doing this because I'm trying to impress that woman over there? Or am I doing this because of the hadith we just learned and I really want to put it into effect? I want to really implement it. That's called holding yourself accountable before you do a deed and holding yourself accountable afterwards. Before we do the deed, like Anissa said, we have to check our intentions. If you want Allah to accept your good deeds, you have to uh, hold yourself accountable before doing it. Allah says, rush to do good. But you want to make sure that what you're rushing to do is done for the right reason, which is to please Allah, not to be seen a man. And then you want to make sure that whatever you're rushing to do is done the way Allah commanded us to do it, the way he legislated too. So mashallah on that, uh, Sister Anissa. Anyone else would like to share? Go ahead, Sister Norto. Um, for the first question, it just kind of takes me back um, to what the what we learned a couple months back about, you know, being in the world as a stranger, a stranger or a traveler. And, um, you know, a person who's like, you know, with that, with what you said, like, you know, we, as a person who's trying to rack up as much good deeds as they can, you know, they don't wait for the evening to do what they need to do. You know, they do what they need to do, like at that moment. Oh, what can I do today to please Allah? Like how much, what can I do that's within me that I can uh, make Allah proud of me? The person doesn't wait until a certain hour to do such things. The person each hour, they're in constant of, oh, let me take this and this will make Allah happy with me. They just try to do as much good as they can within, within what's in, you know, their power. So that's what, that's what I would say. Yeah, so Allah says, rush to do good deeds. Don't put them off. Don't wait. A lot of people, for example, say they're going to make Hajj. A lot of people I know have the financial ability to make Hajj. They have the mahram. They have the money. They have their health. But I'm going to wait, Sister Layla. I'm only 30 years old. I want to wait till I'm old to make Hodge so I can be forgiven of all my sins. What a loser. What guarantee do you have that you're going to even live to see old age? You know how people are dropping like hot, hot cakes? Supana Allah. What guarantee do you have that you will live to see 80 years old? And why would you put off making Hodge when you're healthy? Hodge is a jihad. It's a struggle. It's hard doing that to walk. It's hard doing that sigh. I think the sigh is worse than the tawah. Subhana Allah, you're going to wait till your knees are bad, until your back is bad to make hajj. You know, where you got to have somebody push you in a buggy. When you were healthy, you know, you put it off. So that's another way of looking to, you know, we have to rush to do the good deeds while we're healthy, while we have our mental state, while we're living, while we can afford to do those deeds. There's a lot of people I know who are old and ain't never made Hodge because, well, I waited too long. I could have made it when I was in my 30s, but now, you know, I can't do nothing. I should have done it then. Yeah, should have, could have, would have. That's shirk. Should have, could have, would have. And don't think that Allah is not going to ask us, why did you put off making Hajj when I gave you the financial ability and, and health when you were young? 
Good point, Sister uh, um, Norcho. Go ahead, Sister S Sahara. Go ahead. So I was going to say um, what everybody else said, but also it's very important to like rush to good deeds because you never really know what state you're going to die in. You want to be aware of, well, you want to die not in a state of Islam in a good, you, well, I don't know how to explain it. It's kind of difficult, but you don't want to put yourself in a like situation where like your death is like not the best. If that makes sense, like that, yeah, an, an example would be like, oh, like, you know, you weren't supposed to drink and you never done it. You tried it for the first time. And then the first time you tried it, like you overdosed, you know, yeah. instead yeah. of, you know, going to the mosque and praying, you want to die, not in the state of Islam and always keep a law um, on your mind, no matter what. That's what I was going to say. Exactly. Because things, you know, remember the prophet talked about how one of the signs of the last hour is a person can be a wake up a believer in the morning and then go to bed a, a go to bed at night a kafir because he done did something that he shouldn't have done he has, he said something or did something that took him out of Islam or remember any time we're sinning maybe you went to bed fornicating with somebody Whenever we com commit a sin our iman leaves our heart anyway your faith is gone and what if Allah should give you a heart attack while you're performing that action? Well, look, you died in a state of disbelief. You know, so we have to be careful, guys. You know, we should rush to do good deeds as soon as we can. You don't want to put them off. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stressed this over and over and over to the companions, over and over and over to us in many hadiths. And that brings us to the next question. We also talked about how the Muslim personality is one that honors and keeps the trust that he or she has with others and the trust that he and she has with Allah. Why is keeping the trust so important? Why is it so important for us as Muslims to keep and fulfill our trust? Anyone? It's important for us to keep our trust because that is what Allah gave us. He gave us trust over our body to make sure that we take care of it, to feed it, to nurture it. He gave us our trust in believing in him and obeying his word. Yeah, keeping the trust is keeping your heart right with Allah. He commands us to honor the things we are entrusted with, such as our bodies, such as the people under our care, the people that, that we are obligated to, uh, the positions of authority that we hold, the people that we serve, subhanAllah. For example, you're a nurse. You have to honor the trust. You can't violate that trust. You're a nurse. You honor the rights of your patients. You do not abuse your patients or violate their rights. You're a teacher. That's a trust between you and those students and their parents. You keep the trust. You don't want to be one of these teachers as in the news here in America for child molestation. A teacher who violated the sanctity of teacher and student and you're having uh, relations with your middle school students, like a lot of these men and, men and women. I mean, I'm surprised to see how many women are having sexual relationships, female teachers having relationships with their middle school, their 14, 15 year old students. You violate the trust. They're, those parents entrusted you to educate their children, not to take advantage of them. You know, if you're an imam, you want to honor the trust. You don't want to violate the trust of the, 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 that you have over the people. So keeping the trust is keeping our hearts good and clean with Allah. Plus keeping the trust, this is one of the, the uh, uh, these are the people who are truthful. Those who keep the trust are those who are truthful and written in the book of Allah as being truthful. Okay, good job. 
Also, the next question, we talked about how another component of the Muslim personality is to only fear Allah and not the people. And this is something bad because most Muslims today fear the people. You ask those women who don't wear hijab, why they don't wear hijab, I'm afraid of what the people are going to say about me. I'm afraid of what my coworkers will think of me. I'm afraid if, that I might lose my job. I'm afraid, I'm afraid. Why is it important for us to fear a law and not the people, anyone? Why is it important to fear a law and not the people? Allah is our creator. Allah is going to judge us on the day of judgment. Allah is seeing everything we do, hearing everything we say right here, right now. We are accountable only to Allah's Ta'ala, not to people, only what Allah has entrusted us to do with the people. But our entire being is to be in submission to the will of Allah. Okay, one of the reasons why is because we are accountable to Allah, not the people. Allah will be the one to judge us and decide our outcome, not the people. Why else? Anyone else? Why else is it important to only fear Allah, not the people? Go ahead, Norto. <laughs> when one um, fears Allah, they're not... Um... Like they think twice about the actions they do because they know that Allah, you know, will judge them on what they do. And they also like, um, they think twice because, you know, they think the punishment of Allah is not something that, you know, they would want to go through. So they think twice about their actions before doing something. Okay. A person that fears Allah will think twice of Allah as a punishment. Okay. But what else? Something that y'all didn't really mention. That when you're talking about fearing Allah and not the people, fearing Allah and not the people, why is it that I should only fear Allah and not the people? There's a main reason why that I'm surprised that none of y'all saying. If you're fearing um, people, it's like associating partners with Allah. Why? I was going to say that only Allah is like capable of like harming or benefiting. Fear, that's you. what I'm looking for. The people cannot, the reason, that's what Fardalsa was saying too. Good job, Fardalsa. Good job, Melion. Why is it important to fear in law and not the people? Well, no one can harm or benefit you unless a law allows it. That's something that we have to remember. And that's what you tell the people. When I come upon young girls or young women who tell me that they don't wear hijab because they're so afraid, you know, Sister Layla, I was raised in a, a, a Hunkiesville. What's that? Hunkiesville. I live with a lot of people who are rednecks and don't know anything. And subhanAllah, they never seen a Muslim. And I'm afraid that the Hunkiesville people might try to hurt me. Guess what? I lived in Hunkies Bill of Bill, Ohio. I lived in Batavia, Google Batavia, Ohio, the most redneck part of Ohio. I was the only Muslim there for five years. Most of the people would, used to come to me and say they never in their life seen a Muslim except on TV. They didn't know that we really existed. But did that stop me from wearing a hijab? Did that stop me from being a Muslim? The Ku Klux Klan had rallies there in the summer. They used to come, they even came to my job, the Ku Klux Klan, and put stuff up, you know, on, the, on the, the buildings where I worked at. But did that stop me from being a Muslim? Did that stop me from wearing a hijab? No, because I knew that those people in Hunkiesville could not hurt me. They could not harm me unless a law allowed it. The Klan could do nothing to me unless a law allowed it. I had a law as my protector. I had no family, no friends. I had to live there for five lonely, hard years and be stared at, be gossiped about, be set up on the job. All their plans were foiled. They tried to set me up to get me fired over and over and over. They never went nowhere. They tried to get the clients to attack me. The clients end up attacking them and loving me. You know, Allah is in control. 
You know, so you tell the people we should never fear people because no one can harm you unless the law allows it. A person can shoot bullets at you and those bullets can go everywhere but hit you unless a law says hit that person. We have to trust in a law, believe in him, fear him. If you walked around with that attitude, you would be so confident that even Shaitan would run away from you. Why do you think Shaitan used to run away from Umar? Shaitan himself ran away from Umar because Umar didn't fear anyone but a law. Yes, go ahead, Sister Lucy. So that's the most important reason why, because if all the men on earth and all the women on earth were to gather together to take you out, they couldn't do nothing. They were to shoot uh, machine guns at you. Not a bullet would touch you unless a law guides it there. We are titanium. Go ahead, Lucy. We're going to go with Fresno saying, man doesn't have a heaven or hell to put you in, so don't fear him. Because they can't do nothing. They made the same way you are. Exactly. We all come from the same insignificant substance. And we have no control over nothing. Allah already knew what we would do. Allah already decided what our fate would be as a result. As Allah says in the Quran, the book has been written. The ink has dried. So you and I have no power to do nothing unless Allah allows it or willed it. And he already determined what he was going to do before we were even born. Hello. So that's why some people can take bullets coming at them and they, they, it's not that the bullets ricochet off. I had a person email me about this yesterday. Sister Layla, you know, I'm from the hood. This is our Iman. By the way, he sends his salams to you, Sister Antar. Iman from Compton. <laughs> Are you listening to me, ma'am? I told you I was going to share your story today. We got one of the Imams from Compton. Compton. Y'all know about Compton. Y'all heard about Crenshaw. Crenshaw is a Supreme, was Supreme's neck of the wood. Crench, uh, Sabrine is moving up. She, she moving to East Hollywood, Beverly Hills, down the street from Brentwood. So it ain't her neck of the woods no more. But the imam here from Compton shared a story with me. He says, Sister Layla, one day when we was trying to establish ourselves in the hood, we are established now. He let me be, let it be known. Compton is already established. But when we were trying to establish ourselves with the gangs here, he said, you want to know what happened, how we got established? He said, one day, he said, I was getting out my car, getting ready to go into the mosque. A gang, a, a two cars of gang thuggers drove up. Sister Layla, they started shooting. I mean, it was like 10 dudes. They shot and shot and shot. And I stood there like this, Sister Layla, not moving. And after the, it seemed like the gunfire went on for 10 minutes. And I just knew I was dead. But I couldn't figure out why I wasn't falling and hitting the ground yet. He said when they got, when they shot all their bullets, they emptied their firearms. He, he said, Sister Layla, I was still standing. Do you know those gangsters, they got out the car, they, they jumped in their car, they said, how the hell did those bullets ricochet off of him? He said, and Sister Layla, when I, when I, I, when I, st I opened my eyes, I said, y'all better get up out of here before a lost sin, his wrath. He said, those little thugs got in their car, they were the crips or something. And they drove off. And that's how this mosque and Compton got established. They said, y'all better leave them Muslims alone. Them people crazy. You know, we, we emptied our guns on this, that dude, and all the bullets ricocheted. He said, Sister Layla, I didn't have a mark on me. Did they really ricochet? I said, brother, no, they didn't ricochet. 
I said, what happened is Allah sent the angels of mercy. Those angels of mercy stood in front of you. They stood behind you. They stood to the side of you and they spread it their wings like this, Aki. And the bullets that those gangsters shot at you, they protected you. Remember, nothing will harm you unless Allah has decreed it. So the bullets didn't ricochet. No, those angels, the angels are the soldiers of Allah. Just like when Abu Bakr, I gave you guys a story of Abu Bakr last week. When Abu Bakr and the prophet were in that cave, the Quraysh were right there and they didn't see them. It wasn't because of no, no uh, bird's nest. It wasn't because of no spider web. Allah says in the Quran, his armies, his army of angels spread at their wings like this. Now, y'all see why I like the, the, the bat wing abaya? It reminds me of the angels. They spread their wings like this, and those Quraysh could not see. So just like they shielded the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Abu Bakr, Aki, they shielded you. The brother emailed me back this morning saying, mashallah, thank you, sister, because that's how we were established here in a Compton. And he said, by the way, we inviting you to do a lecture. I told him, I'm sorry, I'm going to stay away from Compton. I'm sorry, I can only visit Fresno because my sister holds down Fresno. I said, if it ain't Fresno or Hollywood, I'm sorry, I ain't going nowhere near LA. It ain't for me. <laughs> Unless I'm going where Sabrina is in East Hollywood, my peeps is in Fresno. They ain't in LA. <laughs> but mashallah, I told him I was going to share his story. And he said, that's how the mosque in Compton got established. He said, to this day, people talk about that how that gang, the Crips or whatever they were, they, they tried to shoot that imam down. That imam is old now. He's one of the regular students and he's in his seventies now. May Allah bless you brother from Compton. And he sends his salams to Amina Antar. Hello, what that supposed to mean? Figure it out, two, three, four. Hello, hit the dough. Seems like Antar getting a lot of action these days. But anyway, you know, don't fear the people. Fear Allah. Just like he didn't fear no crips. He didn't fear no bloods. Just like Sabrine don't fear nobody. She fear Allah. Allah got her. Allah has us all. And that brings us to the last question. What is God consciousness? And why is God consciousness so important? God consciousness is taqwa law. What is God consciousness? What does it mean to be God conscientious? And why is being God conscientious so important? Who can answer that? I would say that it's important to be God. Well, first, um, God consciousness, I think, is have the faith of not seeing a lot, but knowing that he's always there, knowing that he sees everything you do, knowing that he knows everything you think. And I would say that it's important in your life because it will stop you from doing things you know you're not supposed to be doing because even though people can't see you or nobody seems to be around, you know that Allah is always there and he's watching and those angels are always writing things down. Exactly, one of my best students, exactly. Knowing that God consciousness is to know that Allah sees everything that we do. Now, where is Allah? Where is Allah? Allah? Is He's above his throne. Okay. Usually when you ask people where is Allah, they'll say everywhere. Allah is not everywhere. Allah is above his creation. Allah is above the, his throne. Allah is the most high, the most omnipotent. He doesn't have to come down here to earth. He doesn't have to leave where he's at because he know he's conscious of everything. He knew what would happen before it happened. That's why he said the ink is dry. That's why there is nothing that you can do that can change the cotter of Allah. And I wanna repeat that again. 
And I hope my brother, you know who you are over there in England. Please talk about it in your next lecture. You know I play you all the time here. They'll listen to you. You speak like me. We have the same dialect, same peoples, same original teacher, Shay Gatley. Hello, bring it home. Okay, that's why there's nothing you can do that can change your decree, not even your doer. Because everything was written before you were born. Your doer changed before you were born. Allah changed your faith based on his consciousness and knowledge of you. He knew how you would react in whatever situation he put you in. And because he knew what your reaction would be, he chose to change the cotter, to change the result. But he did all of this before we were born. So if you are a person of paradise, you will do the deeds that are going to take you there. If you are a person of the hellfire, you will do the deeds that will take you there. If you are a person of the hellfire, when you are given the bad news, the bad news of sickness, you will make do it. If you are a person of the hellfire, you're going to say, I could care less. I'm going to live forever. Okay, so again, that's consciousness. Allah knows everything, even before it happens. So that's why he commands us. Allah commands us in the Quran to be more conscious of him, to be God conscious of him. Because if you're God conscious of him, you will think twice before you disobey him. If you are conscious of him, you will make dua when things happen. But if you're not conscious of him, he already knew that and that's why you dying. If you are not God conscious, that's how he, that's why you're going to hell. Hello, goodbye. Y'all got that? So that's why it's so important to be conscious of Allah. You know, it'll prevent us from doing things that we shouldn't do. It'll prevent us from doing the deeds that are displeasing to him. MashaAllah, you guys did a good job on this quiz. Are there any questions about any of these answers? Because what I'm gonna do is put the PowerPoint up for today. I'm gonna put the, um, I'm looking on Facebook to make sure no comments. Okay, good. I'm gonna put the PowerPoint up for today because today we're gonna speak about more uh, some more characteristics of the Muslim personality. And let me make sure that everything is okay on this platform. Keep forgetting that I'm on a, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, let me put the PowerPoint up for today's uh, uh, discussion. Oh, where are we at? Oh, these let me throw this away. I can't even on my computer. See, friends, no, you got to keep your desktop clean. You keep your house clean. See that? <laughs> your desktop clean. I'm throwing all this stuff away that I just had, had to re uh, do. I can't do I, I'm an OCD person. Can't stand clutter. I don't even like a cluttered dust desktop. Throw it away. Put it in the garbage. There you go. Okay. Now, let's put the open up the PowerPoint for today's discussion. Okay, where is, wait a minute, which one is this? Am I using the right one? Okay, here we go. This is the Muslim personality, the ninth session. This is the ninth session of the Muslim personality. And again, the book is posted, the link to the book is posted on the video on uh, Facebook and everything. And I also put the link at leonline.com. Make sure you order the book, The Muslim Personality, before it share it sells out. Okay, there's a picture of Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Atli. I'm using his picture because it's his book. It's one of his best works. Okay, he's overlooking everything to make sure that it's, it's presented correctly. Okay, and myself is there because I'm the one giving you the explanation. Okay, so we're gonna go over some of the components some more components of the Muslim personality that we all need to be aware of. And we're gonna start off today with 
being financially responsible. And this is for you brothers out there. Remember guys, each and every one of us is a guardian over someone or something. Every man, you are the guardian over the women in your family, not just your wives, but your sisters who are not married, your mother who is not married, your aunts, your nieces. So we have to accept that responsibility and not be stingy and instead help those who need our help. As the law says in the interpretation, the meaning, oh, Muhammad, tell my servants who believe in me to establish the prayer and to spend from what we have given them, to spend secretly and publicly before a day comes in which there will be no exchanges or friendships. There's a lot of men out there that we women have it really bad today. You know, we are forced to go out and work. That's why a lot of, you know, it's hard. The children are being raised by themselves at home. That's why you got grandkids who ain't got no manners, disrespectful to you. You got daughters and sons and disrespectful because you have to work. The woman has to work. A lot of single women out there don't have a husband. And instead of the men and their families taking care of them, like Islam says they're supposed to, you know, these women are forced now to go out and get jobs to provide for themselves and to provide for their children. So the children are left alone. It's a chain reaction. The children are left alone to themselves because the mother's working 12 hours to try to buy food because it's expensive to try, to try to pay the rent to keep them out of the hood, <clears throat> you know? So the children grow up without any manners. The children grow up without any Islam. They're just Muslim in name only. They don't know how to pray. They don't know how to do anything. They just were told they were Muslims. You, you weren't home to teach them. But in a perfect world, the men of our nation would take care of us women. So we wouldn't have to work. So we could spend the time raising our children. That's in a perfect world, but that world don't exist here. Okay? But we're supposed to, you know, spend of our money. Men are too selfish. Also, Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, oh, you who believe, spend from what we have provided you before day, there comes a day when there is, will be no exchange, no friendship, no intercession. Let a man of money spend from his money. And he whose provision is restricted, let him spend from what Allah has given him. Allah does not charge a soul except according to what he has given. You know, I, one of the things I want to ask you brothers out there, I ain't talking to the husbands. I'm talking to you brothers out there who have nieces, who have grandmothers, who have aunts, who have sisters, who are in need of help. How do you feel knowing that you were in a position that you could have helped pay their rent or you could have just gave them $500 and said, here, this is for you to help you with your bills this month. You know, but instead of you helping your family, you were helping people in the street. You know, charity begins at home. Your, your family has rights over you before anybody else does. For you men out there who are able to help your family, you know that your sister is alone. She has no husband and she's struggling to pay $1,300 a month rent. That's what I pay. Y'all see the background? This is my house, my apartment, my kitchen. Yeah, it's beautiful, but it comes with a price, $1,300 a month. That's what my rent is. But alhamdulillah, I take care of myself. Allah has given me the means. But I got four brothers. Do you think any of my brothers and all my brothers are financially secure? Do you think any of my brothers call me up and say, hey, Layla, I'm sending you uh, 500 bucks for the month? Well, one brother did. Issa used to. Issa used to do that. My brother Issa used to get put about a couple of hundred dollars in my account. He ain't did it in a long time, though. Hello. Not in a long time. 
But that's the responsibility of the men in your family, guys, you know, to help the women out. How is it going to be on the day of judgment when you men have to stand before a law and the law say you had a sister who didn't have no husband, who worked like a dog to take care of herself? She retired. She had to pay $1,300 a month to live in a nice area for herself to be safe because she was old and decrepit and, and crippled. You had money after paying your bills. You had a couple of hundred dollars. Instead of you giving it to your sister, you chose to donate it to the mosque. This is important. The family comes first. We got a lot of people. I got an email from another sister today. She says, Sister Layla, my brother, he gives thousands of dollars to the mosque instead of giving me money to help buy food for my children. Don't you know that your family comes eat first, even before the mosque, brothers? We have the hadith where a man came to the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and wanted to leave a third of his estate to the mosque. The prophet said, do you have any children? He said, yes. He said, leave it with your, for your kids so they don't have to go around begging. Another hadith, another man asked, could he leave money for the sake of Allah with the mosque? The prophet said, you got sisters? Leave it with your sisters. So you brothers need to wake up. Y'all got sisters who have no husbands. I ain't talking about the ones that's married. The ones that's married, they husband supposed to take care of them. But if you got sisters that are single, even though those sisters, you may think that they're financially secure because they got an apartment like mine, but we need help. You know how kind that would be for you to give me 500 bucks? That's $500 I can spend on food, on cat litter. I got three cats. That other sister got three children. You donating thousands of dollars to the mosque each month. Brother, you got to help your sister. With, she got three children. Food is expensive. Charity begins at home. It starts with your family first. Your mother, your sisters, your aunts, your grandparents, your nieces, and then your cousins. The moss comes after that. You brothers don't believe it. Y'all better learn y'all's dean. Again, for my brothers across the sea in the United Kingdom, please talk about this. My brothers in Australia that's holding it down, please talk about it because they don't like hearing it from me. I'm a woman, but they'll listen to you because you're a man. So again, you men need to wake up. Take care of your family first. You know, your sisters, aunts, your uh, grandparents and, and nieces. Brother, but then the mosque comes after that, okay? Also, another component of the Muslim personality is, again, that we put emphasis on teaching our children a religion. And again, this is hard to do because the parents are working. We're working. The kids are at home by themselves. Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, command your family to offer the prayer and to be regular in praying. How can you assure that your children are praying every day if you're not there to check behind them? Also, Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, oh, you who believe, save yourselves and your families from a fire of fuel, which is for men and, and which is for men. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, command your children to pray when they are seven years of age and spank them and make them pay, pray when they are 10. How can we honor this when we're not home? It's our responsibility, guys, to make sure that our children know our religion and are and living by it. 
We have to make sure that the kids are praying. Make sure that the kids are fasting. Make sure that the kids understand why they pray, why they fast. Subhana Allah, the Muslim personality is one that keeps emphasis on his or her children and family because Allah is going to ask you about them on the day of judgment. And also, the Muslim personality is one that seeks simplicity in life. Let me explain what this means. Because we have some Sufi people out there who believe that it's haram, you know, to spend a lot of money or to, to for example, I have a Louis Vuitton. I have a bunch of Louis Vuitton. I got a whole collection of Louis Vuitton. You got some Muslims out there who say, oh, it's takfullah. That's extravagant. You should just go and get you a goodwill purse. No, no, no. I can live according to my means. If I can afford Louis Vuitton, I'm going to buy Louis Vuitton. Why would I go to a, a goodwill store and get some rinky-dink hand-me-down, you know, when Allah has blessed me, blessed me with the means to, to get the things I like, just like Uthman. That's one of the reasons why they killed Uthman. They slandered his character. They slandered him because he liked nice things in life. He liked the, the finer things of life. He could afford it. He was a multimillionaire. You know, so we're not saying that you have to be, live a poor life. What we're saying is don't live beyond your means. If all you can afford is Chanel, then you stick to Chanel. Why buy Louis Vuitton and go in debt? There's something I had to share with my granddaughter. I said, if all you can afford is coach, then buy coach. Why would you buy Michael Kors if, if my, buying Michael Kors is going to put you in debt? You know, simplicity, the simple things. You know, Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, this worldly life is nothing more than amusement and fun. But the hereafter is the real life if you only knew. So many of us put emphasis on this world and we put less emphasis on the hereafter. Also, Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, know that the life of this world is simple play. It's a pastime. It's an adornment. It's a world where people boast and brag. It's a world where people compete with each other in their money. But in the hereafter, there awaits a severe punishment for the wrongdoers. So again, guys, you don't want to become so engrossed in the life of this world that you become remiss in your obligations to Allah. Like Sister Sabrine was saying earlier, rush to do your good deeds. Rush to do what's right because you never know when, when death will come. And then none of those, nothing is going to follow you to the grave except your deeds. That Michael Kors, that Gucci, that Louis Vuitton is not going to follow you to the grave. The good deeds you did, the way you obey the law, that's what's going to be there for you in that grave. So again, simplicity. We focus on the simple things in life. Like we talked about the other day, the prophet said, what's a person that is self-sufficient? A person that is self-sufficient is a person that has enough food to last him from the, for the day. That's a person that's self-sufficient and content. I know that my bills is paid for this month. My rent's paid, yeah, it may be $1,300, but it's paid for this month. The lights is paid, the gas is paid, cats got their food. You know, I got a freeze, a refrigerator filled, filled with food. So I'm happy. I'm rich. The rich man is the man that's content. The rich man is the man that's self-sufficient. The rich man is the one who, who is happy with what Allah has given him. I got a nice coffee pot. I can make me some coffee if I run out of my uh, 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 Starbucks from Brother Hadji. Hello. Got an ice machine right there. Make me some fresh ice. Got my waterfall over there. Got my clock to tell me the time. What more is there to have? Peace, quiet, tranquility. I'm sitting here with central air, nice air conditioning. I'm self-sufficient. I'm rich. 
because I have what I need for this day. And tomorrow I wake up and same thing. I'll evaluate. I, I'm self-sufficient. You know, so again, guys, simplicity in life. This is what we strive for. We don't sit around competing with others. We don't sit around complaining about what we don't have. We learn to be content with what we do have. Like Sabrine says, subhanAllah, she's going to East Hollywood now. Nice apartment, air conditioning, open floor plan kitchen like mine, wood floors, down the street from Brentwood, Beverly Hills Hotel so Sister Layla can come visit her. Hello, Rodeo Drive. We're going to go check out Sunset Boulevard and go pay a visit to a uh, selling sunset crew. Hello. Simplicity. And thank Allah for all of that. We're going to continue to thank Allah for blessing us with these things. We're going to continue to thank Allah for making these things possible for us. We're going to thank Allah. That's simplicity. And when you thank Allah, Allah will keep the rewards going. Okay. Also, another component of the Muslim personality is we're generous. We pass it forward. We pay it forward. If Allah is good to us, be good to others. This is what Allah wants us to do. If Allah has blessed you, you know, share it, play it, pay it forward. Allah says in the interpretation, the meaning, keep your duty to him as much as you can. Hear and obey him and give in charity. That will be best for you. And whoever is saved from his own selfishness, this is a person who will succeed, not only in this world, but in the hereafter. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if I had in my possession gold to equal the mountain of Buhud, I would not keep it for more than three days because I would give it all away in charity to help others. Accept what I need to pay off my debts. How many of us do that? How many of us pay it forward? Allah has blessed me with a nice life. Allah has blessed me with a good existence. So I'm going to help those in need. You brothers out there, you men out there who don't help your sisters, who don't help your nieces, who don't help your mothers, your aunts, your grandmothers, Allah has blessed you with all that. You know, why don't you help those who are in need? Subhanallah. Allah. The family first. The family, the family, the kinship is under the throne of Allah. Help them first and then the rest of the moms. Okay? So, you know, the Muslim personality is generous, not selfish. And also, the Muslim personality doesn't go around asking when he's not in need. This is important because of you. I woke up today and looked on Facebook. You know how many GoFundMe's I found? What the heck is wrong with y'all? You Muslims today with this GoFundMe. Get up off your rocker and go DoorDash. Get up off your rocker and go Uber. Stop begging from others. Do you know how sinful it is to ask for others when you are not in need of anything? You just want to be, you know, a, a, a spender? You want money so you can go do things that ain't even worth doing? Subhanallah, Allah, change your character. Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, charity is for those who are seriously in need. It's for those who are needy who are too engaged in the cause of Allah to move throughout the land and work. That's who it's for. You got your age, your youth, you're capable, you're healthy. Instead of you making a GoFundMe page, get up off your butt and go move around and do some door dashing. Do y'all know that everybody is hiring now because of the COVID? Starbucks. McDonald's, Starbucks paying $13, $14 an hour. Okay, McDonald's, $15 an hour. Walmart, $15 an hour. Because they can't keep workers. But you want to go do a GoFundMe because you're a lazy, trifling loser. 
Y'all better take that GoFundMe stuff off of Facebook. Y'all crazy, you Muslims are, with this nonsense. Like Allah says, it's only for the needy who are too engaged in the way of Allah to move around and find work. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it would be better if you were to cut a bundle of wood and carry it on your back and take it to the market and sell rather than to go around asking people to give to you who may or may not do so. So that GoFundMe stuff, y'all need to get rid of that. You're gonna, a lot of y'all gonna be answering to a law about that GoFundMe, especially those of you who are young, capable, healthy, and fit. When there's jobs out there, you rather beg from other Muslims. And Muslims, you Muslims who are funding them, y'all just as stupid. Stop throwing your money away on a bunch of losers that you don't even know. Don't y'all know most of the people on the internet are losers who ain't got no life? You sitting there helping some fraud, fraudulent loser. Take your money and help your sisters who don't have husbands. Help your nieces who don't have husbands. Help your grandparents who are alone. Help your aunties who are old and alone. Spend your money on them and leave that GoFundMe crap alone. Okay? And finally, the Muslim personality is one that trusts in Allah. And that's the problem. Why do you go fund me? Because you don't trust in Allah. Remember, Allah tells us, in the interpretation of the meaning, nothing will ever happen unless Allah, except what Allah has written for you to happen. Because he is your protector. So let the believers put their trust in Allah. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there are three things to which I swear and about which I, uh, I speak to you on. So memorize them. He said, one is the money of a person shall not be decreased by that person given in charity. Also, no person suffers injustice and is patient without a law coming to his aid. And no person of Allah opens up a door to begging, except Allah will open up a door for him to poverty. Think about that, you GoFundMeers. That's why you ain't got Jack. You so busy on Facebook doing a GoFundMe, that's why you a poor trifling loser. Allah is gonna keep you as a poor trifling loser until you get up off your behind and go out and get a J-O-B and stop begging from others, okay? So again, guys, the Muslim personality is one that trusts in Allah. I rather trust that Allah will look out for me than to go around begging other people because we have to be humble, which is the last component here of the Muslim personality. We're humble, humble before Allah, humble be with each other. We don't go around begging. We don't go around putting our nose up in the air thinking we're better than others. Humble yourself, Muslims. Humble yourself before Allah and humble yourself with each other. So these are the characteristics, you know, that I wanted to go over today. And again, the book can be ordered by going to www.atleonline.com. The Muslim personality, we have to put these characteristics into practice. We have to change the condition of ourselves, guys, to that which is pleasing and better before Allah. Okay, I'm going to stop right here for today. Uh, let me remind everybody that we do have the Hadith class tonight at 11 p.m., so please make sure that everybody is here for that. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, ashadu an la ilaha ila anta, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. If there's any questions.